I'm uber excited. Well, I was always going to be uber excited about this episode, but I'm positively jumping for joy. I'll tell you why in a minute. I'm Patricia, and I'd like to welcome you to the Haiku P podcast, episode 7 of the fourth series. So why am I so enthusiastic about today's episode? Well, it's because I'm chatting with Randy Brooks. All about the seasonal element of haiku. You can see the full chat on our YouTube channel. This one is going to be a slightly shorter version. And then there's more. Ted Sherman, one of the editing team for this month, is with us to tell us about a terrific project he's involved with, bringing haiku to prisons in the UK. And then, just as I was putting the finishing touches to the podcast, I got some terrific news. I think I told you that last year I was invited to nominate some of our work for the Haiku Foundation's Touchstone Awards. Well, a piece of our work is on the long list. I'm so happy. Congratulations to Richard Tice. His long-listed poem is this. Our car, never nearer the shimmer of black water on the desert road. I'm delighted for Richard, but so proud of us too, because the work we've been doing to contribute to the pantheon of excellent haiku and senryu has been recognised. There are, of course, many of the community who've been long-listed too. Congratulations to all of them. And if you'd like to read that list, the link will be on the show notes. Now, before I introduce Randy to you, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. A big thank you to James Young and Robert Horobin for all their work last month as editors of the submissions to the No Ego podcast. You'll be able to hear the poems they've chosen in the next episode. And now you need to keep this month's editing team busy with your euphony submissions. Haiku and Senryu really utilising sound. The deadline's the 20th of April. In one of my recent mailings, I asked you to send me your five favourite haiku, the ones you'd like to bring with you to a desert island. Thanks to all of you who've done that already, but keep them coming. I'm creating a new project, which I'll tell you more about later in the year. And speaking of new projects, I'd like to try something new to keep us writing haiku. A monthly video to inspire you to write. You'll find the video on our YouTube channel, PTV Community Haiku. Please go and have a look and write your haiku in the comments section. Comment on the other haiku too, because I'd really like our YouTube channel to be a way for the community to connect with each other. And of course, a link will be in the show notes. Now let's listen to the chat I had with Randy, or at least some of it. I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to speaking to our latest guest, Randy Brooks. It's not the first time we've spoken. He was a superhero moderator for me last year for the Haiku Society of America's Zoom conference. But today the tables are turned and he's the one giving the workshop on seasonal elements in haiku. It's a topic we're going to be looking at a few times this year. Now, most of you will know Randy, but for the very few of you who don't, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Millican University where he teaches courses on book publishing and various haikai poetry traditions. He and his wife, Shirley Brooks, are publishers of Brooks Books and co-editors of Mayfly Haiku magazine. The next submissions are due by the 15th of May. Now, he's also on the executive committee of the Haiku Society of America as the electronic media officer. He maintains the website and edits the web sampler issues of Frog Pond. He serves as the webmaster for Modern Haiku Press and as web editor of Modern Haiku magazine. He's on the board for the American Haiku Archives. 
clearly a busy chap, he also serves on the editorial board for the Red Moon Press Haiku Anthologies and Juxtaposition Journal of Scholarship on Haiku. His most recent books include Walking the Fence, Selected Tanker, and The Art of Reading and Writing Haiku, A Reader-Response Approach. Both were published in 2019. Don't worry, there'll be a link in the show notes. Before I ask Randy to give us a much-anticipated workshop, let me read you one of his haiku. Dirt farmer's wife at the screen door, no tractor sound. Dirt farmer's wife at the screen door, no tractor sound. That's from Modern Haiku 8.1, going back to 1977. But I read about it in an essay in Frog Pond 34.1 in 2011. Again, the link's in the show notes if you'd like to read it. What I love about Good Haiku is its ability to connect us in terms of our experience. And from what you say in the essay, Randy, I believe this is an homage to one of your grandmothers. It is. Now, you could have written grandmother or woman at the screen door in the first line, but what a great phrase you've used instead. Dirt farmer's wife. It suggested immediately to me her economic class. And as the descendant of dirt farmers, albeit in a different world, it created immediately a picture of the woman and her dress and the view she's looking at. You've left us, the readers, space to interpret and to claim the poem as our own. Personally, I regard a haiku as successful when someone tells me that the poem spoke to them, and especially if they have their own story to go with it. And I feel that I've given someone a small but precious gift. And you, Randy, have given me this gift with your poem. I thank you for it. Thank you, Patricia. Now, I'm going to hand over the reins to you because I know you've got some pretty impressive verses to engage us with. Well, well thank you with that, that invitation and so glad to be here in your podcast. And really pleased that you, you like the uh, Dirt Farmer's Wife haiku. It is a haiku that's very special to me it's as, a, as an homage to my, my grandmother, Fonzie Brooks. And... You know, in, in Western Kansas, where I grew up, where that haiku comes from, it's, it's a place where there's dry wheat land. And, uh, and so there's only sort of two types of farmers out there, really. Well, maybe three. There's cattle ranchers who have huge property, but you can't farm it. You can only graze it. And so they ride their horses and, and have the cattle. And then there's the, the farmers who own their land and quite often are descendants of homesteaders. And then there's the dirt farmers who cash rent. And so their, their income depends upon sharing the crop. So in some parts of the United States, they'd be called, you know, sharecroppers. But in, in Western Kansas, they're called dirt farmers because they know the dirt and they work the dirt. And, and so dirt farmer's wife at the screen door, no tractor sound. For me, it's a, it is one of those earliest mem- images and memories of my grandmother and how much she cared for my grandfather and was part of the team out there in Western Kansas, you know, where the houses are all one mile apart from each other or more for neighbors and community and stuff. I'm glad you started with that one in some ways because, you know, it really shows how I was writing haiku out of, out of my childhood. And I was trying to capture the sense of being there in that space and in that openness and stuff and capture some of the things that are, that are more than just the immediate image on. I'm gonna take a, a reader's approach to this. And so I want to share discussion and talking about, about several haiku as a way to look at um, the seasonal element and its use in haiku from several poets. I wanna start with poet Aubrey Cox. He's a very young haiku writer, uh, one of my former students, done very well. And I just wanna talk about how for me, Kigo, while in the Japanese tradition has a fairly formal conception and definition and tradition of key words that have been used for hundreds of years sometimes in Japanese poetry, and they immediately call up previous poems and haiku, um, or even plays, they've got a lot of allusion to them and stuff. In the Western tradition in English language haiku, we don't share such a sort of well-defined conception of of a part of the haiku as Kigo, actually. But we certainly do understand and relate to what Kigo does in the Japanese tradition in our own haiku in English as well. This is why I'm gonna to refer to it primarily as a seasonal element in English haiku, rather than technically Kigo. Kigo have, have come out of a long tradition of, of sort of almost dictionaries or, or encyclopedias of, of uh, synonyms and stuff 
that are all seasonally arranged, phrases that, that are, can be used and recognized immediately in a Japanese haiku as there's the kigo, there's the phrase that represents that whole that whole season. But again, in English language haiku, this comes about more intuitively in the reading of the haiku. We connect with a season through an image, and through that image, we're connecting to a collective consciousness and understanding of, of that as a sort of added value to the haiku. So this is my, my first main point to make is that, you know, the one thing that um, a lot of English haiku writers have resisted is the idea of something being sort of an artificial element, something to stick in to your poem, a piece of following a rule or a tradition just to do that. Instead, it's, it's been usually more of an intuitive sense that, you know, if we have a seasonal element as part of a context of a haiku, it enriches and expands and creates an aura of being there, a presence in that time of year and that time of space that we all can relate to from our experience. So starting with that sort of, sort of caveat that a few of the examples I'm going to read to you probably come from somebody thinking, oh, I've got to make sure I include a kigo in my haiku. These are good examples of how some of our, some of our very fine English language writer, haiku writers have employed a seasonal element with great effect in their haiku. So I'll start with this one by Aubrey Cox, Wilted Lilacs, Your Hand Slips From Mine. In this haiku, we can start with the wilted lilacs. And of course, lilacs are, are sort of a, you know, a, a late spring or early summer flower. For us, it's in, it's in May, around Mother's Day quite often and stuff. And wilted lilacs, they're, they're dying, they're, they're, they're fading. But the fragrance is still vivid and strong. And so I'm getting this wilted lilacs, I'm getting a sense of, they're not as beautiful as they were, but they're still fragrant, they're still beautiful um, in their own way. And we're in that whole aura then of that, of that fragrant lilacs. But they're dying, they're wilted, they're leaving us. They've been here and they're, they're not going to be here long. Your hand slips from mine. And then that hand slips from mine, is that just, it's open, of course, to how people imagine that. But is it somebody's hand that they're holding that's dying? Is this somebody's hand that's, that's people have been out for a wonderful, wonderful springtime walk and now they're, they're going their ways? You know, uh, anyway, we get that sense of things passing and things that were wonderful and beautiful and, and, and precious moving and leaving us. So your hand slips from mine. So the touch, the lilacs, they all combine into the sense of both the appreciation of the moment, but also a little bit of loss in this one. So again, the lilacs are having a huge part of this haiku and put us there and give us presence in that time of year and that sense of departure. Let's go to another haiku by, by Aubrey Cox. Helicopter seeds, my life spiraling out of control. I was going to wait till, the, till you'd finished the next one, maybe, but the point is, is good, I think. What I like about the first three that you've highlighted on here is that they are not traditional, not necessarily traditional images or seasonal images, are they? I love that Aubrey has thought around the subject and has found new ways, relatively new ways to express that seasonal connection. And the helicopter seeds. I was on a walk the other day freezing cold day, still mm -hmm. winter here, still bits of snow around. I was really surprised to see right in front of me at one point on the walk, the helicopter seeds. And I thought, I'd love to write about this. But um, to me, helicopter seeds speak of autumn. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you, what do you think? Right. So we think of them as coming down in autumn and, you know, they're maple seeds, what they are. But again, it's, it's, so, it's so fun that when we see them, whether, whether we're in that season or not, we still feel the sense of what they're doing and why they're doing that. I remember it, I was in Chicago once with a group of haiku poets, including, including a great poet from, from uh, Japan. And we're standing there looking out on, on Lake Michigan and we're trying to write haiku, we're on a ginkgo. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's sitting there taking it all in and, and he writes this marvelous haiku about this, this sort of cloud that's pressing down on Lake Michigan and pressing the wind towards us, of course, in the windy city. And I'm like, yeah, but this is summer. He's like, no, I already feel the fall and winter coming on with that cloud. I, it doesn't matter. The season is not really what we're literally experiencing at that moment. It is a feeling of, of that time that sort of we're already imagining and anticipating. 
so that, oh. so that the season goes and jumps beyond sometimes where you actually are. So, That's a good point, actually. Yes. Yeah. Good. I can go back to my notes and rethink that whole okay. thing now. Thank you okay very much. To write your, your helicopter <laughs> seed haiku now. But on, on this one, that helicopter seeds, my life spiraling out of control. What I love about what she did with this is she didn't say maple seeds. And helicopter seeds, and using that as the phrase for it, is a playful, almost childlike way of describing them. And it's a very contemporary word too, helicopter. And yet we know it's not this loud, choppy sound of a helicopter either. We know it really is the seeds and their quiet, gentle spin. And we can imagine them quite quickly. But the phrase itself evokes a childlike playfulness of, oh, it's helicopter seeds. My life's spiraling out of control. So again, we connect this sense of the movement and the spiraling. And my life is the whole thing happening. But it's the helicopter seeds, they look like they're at random. Maybe they're not. Maybe your life's not spun out of control as much as you think. You're just in a moment of change and transition. We don't know where you go. So what I love about the seasonal elements coming in with some of these is that, you know, at first we just think they're disparate, but they actually connect them as readers and see there is a, a internal comparison happening or a, a glue that holds them and makes them apt without turning them into metaphors. The helicopter seeds really still get to be helicopter seeds. Mm. You know, we don't have to make them something else. Day before Easter, I learned something about my father. And again, as in in Japanese traditions and holidays and and special occasions, bon festivals and various things, in our culture, in our places, you know, we have different sort of markers of time and and years and events. And some of them are more religious events. Some are more more just secular turns of the calendar um, and celebrations. Day before Easter, yeah. So here she's tapping into to, uh, to part of what is Easter about? Renewal, the whole the whole Easter story, of course. Mm. Sacredness, and yet something's amiss. Something's not right too. It's also about death and loss, and longing and and rebirth and and these issues. Day before Easter, getting ready for Easter, anticipating this thing. Yet I learned something about my father, and it's so vague. What is this something? It's not a clear thing. It's not a definite thing. And so it says this interesting sort of deep sort of spiritual doubt and and depth of wondering. Um, So I think it's a really great positioning of a faith crisis or growth or realization within that time of of the moment of change before Easter. I think, I think you're right. And when I read this the first time, I really felt sort of a, a panic about it there was something something as you said something amiss whatever she learned I felt it might felt it wasn't a good thing but then I started thinking like you did about yeah what's this at the day before Easter what does that mean now it could mean that you know Easter, Easter is a time when there were a lot of people doubting sort of the resurrection as it were that could still have that element of doubt and, and fear and whatever but I learned something about my father and I'm rather hoping that the story is is more about renewal and the reviving of a relationship. And, and so it, Easter's meant to be a sort of hopeful yeah. celebration, isn't it? So yeah. I'm sort of hoping that this is a hopeful thing that, you know, before Easter, before Easter, they had this, you know, maybe in a relationship that was really not very good. And then she learned something and that we don't know what, it's mysterious, but hopefully yeah. that thing she learned reconnects them in a relationship that's going to be hopeful and move forward in a positive Very direction. Nice. Yeah. That's where I came with that one. Very nice. Yeah, there's some angst, but we, we there's not a loss of hope either. Yes. No, no, there's not. Very nice. Yeah. So again, again, this is so this is not just a a let's go to the first thing we think of when we think of Easter. Let's 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 enter that space, but let that be the the context that the haiku is playing in and moving in. Um, the next one by Aubrey. Autumn leaves. New neighbors take down the treehouse. Fairly straightforward in terms of the seasonal element. Autumn leaves, new neighbors take down the treehouse. Again, the, we both get the leaves and things falling and, and the, the branches are starting to clear out um, so we can see things more clearly. We go, oh no, they're taking the treehouse down. It's, the tree will never look the same. I used to be able to see the treehouse clearly once the leaves went down. Now it's just going to be gone. Also that sense of new neighbors and somebody else has left. Not only the leaves are leaving again, but, the, but somebody has left besides 
the leaves now leaving and stuff. So things change, seasons move. We go through them, we get new neighbors and we miss some of the things we had, but again, it's sort of both the old and the new coming together here. I often find that autumn poems have a melancholy about them automatically because, you know, as you said, it's, it's a time of change and it's you're going into a cold season. It's, you know, I love autumn, but I really don't like winter, particularly here. And this one to me speaks as, as someone who's had new neighbours recently, is sort of a, a little bit about the, the angst of losing the old ones and the relationship you had and what will the new one bring and watching them take down something that possibly has a history to you because, you know, the treehouse speaks of children that have grown up and yeah. moved on. So I find this one quite, quite sad. Yeah, some of that it, autumn loss and melancholy. I mean. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. So that's a few examples of how how we see some seasonal element in some of Aubrey's work. In each case, they create a R that connects out there and puts us into a moment in a scene. And, and again, my main point about the seasonal element or Kigo, it taps into to a more universal human experience. It helps us create a presence that's in a, in a space. And typically it's in a space that, because it's seasonal, outdoors a little bit. So it, it creates a space for us to, to be in and to take in that whole sort of context and broader scene and setting of a haiku. And so it becomes, becomes part of that, that enriching of the context the haiku is taking place in. And, and sometimes it sort of sets the scene quickly. In most of hers, we get a quick setting from each one of these. It's the first line, you know? And then from that, we sort of see where she's going. This connects to what we'll look at next in Haiku from Peggy Lyles and her book, To Hear the Rain. And in the introduction to her book, she talks about how she wants people to read her haiku. And I think this also sort of shows the, the value again of putting haiku into a seasonal context really enriches that, that shared universal collective consciousness that we can bring to a haiku. So she says, read them slowly, individually, more than once, preferably aloud. Above all, I want you to read them with assurance of their essential honesty and faith that what you find in them is what they mean and are. I hope the poems link your, to your sensory perceptions and affirm a connection between Robert Frost called inner and outer weather. I hope they touch your sense of wonder, stirring responses that make the sharing mutual. I hope they spark the desire, new or renewed, to write and share your own haiku. Yes, much is left out. That is the way of haiku. The omissions leave room for each reader to become part of the experience and to take the haiku to whatever breadth and depth he discovers. So Peggy, in her work, is very much sort of seeing the haiku as this gift of consciousness and perception and awareness. And, um, and she's wanting, wanting to invite the reader into the space of each haiku and to, to seek out this what is genuine and honest and true to human nature, to human beings. Could you maybe elaborate on what you think the inner and outer weather yeah. is in her, in her terminology? I, I think what, what she's talking about how is that we do get, again, and this is partly the seasonal element that brings this, we get an outer weather, a sense of where we are and what that, what is the thing that's happening in, in the broader sense of, of the world and nature and its cycles and what, what is truly always there. So the outer weather is what we are, the context again we're in, in that sort of horizontal plane of what's happening now, where are we, what's the setting of the scene, and how is, what is the nature of that space. And within that outer weather, it's not just, we're not separate from it. We don't, we don't bring it into us in some way. We don't, we don't just sort of, um, you know, we don't categorize it as this intellectual thing. We are immersed in it. And our inner, inner weather is affected by the outer weather. And by that, it's a sense that how, you know, we've, we've got everything from seasonal depression to, to just feeling that lightheartedness of a, of a, of a bright 
spring day when we finally can get outside, you know? So the inner weather is that how we are continually responsive to where, to where we are. And sometimes we bring our own inner weather. We try, we cloud things up even when they're not cloudy. But more, more often in haiku, we're seeing a, a sort of conjunction or a coming together of the outer weather and the inner weather is fitting. And it makes sense that we're feeling these ways as we're in this context. That's sort of the, the tension of the inner and the outer weather. You know, we talk about juxtaposition and haiku and, you know, the one image to the other image. This is about a juxtaposition of the inner spirit and the outer experience. Ishikawa in Japanese talked about, you know, haiku aren't just about what we see out here. They're about, he took his glasses off and he pointed his chest. They're about what we see in here too. In fact, they're more about what we see in here. Somehow what we see in here we, if we, if we're, if we don't separate ourselves from what's out there, we become one. And, and so that's part of this inner outer weather. So let's take a look at some of, of Peggy's haiku. Lightning flash, the brass quintet tuning up. Yeah, lightning flash, the brass quintet tuning up. For this one, for like that inner outer weather sort of thing, what I see again is this lightning flashes we're outside where the lightning's going on. It's just, it's just starting. It's, it's the first flashes. Maybe the storm's coming on or not. Um, you know, it's not the middle of a storm. It's, it's, this is an outdoor concert. We're in summer and the brass quintet tuning up. They're getting ready for a concert. And, and they're, they're, just, they're just getting their instruments out. They're checking their valves and their oils and their... And, they too are, are doing these little runs of and they're doing their scales and they're getting their lip warmed up just as the lightning flash is perhaps just the warm up of the storm that maybe is coming or maybe it's going to pass by. So the lightning flash, and I also love the lightning flash. I get the, the light within the sky, but I get the, the, the light on the brass instruments a little bit here too. And so this is all coming together and we're about wanting to be there to enjoy that concert. But now we're getting a, a free show in the sky right now too and stuff. And, you know, we hope they can get too crazy and cancel the concert. Honest. Or maybe we can at least have an umbrella if we, if we have to. And they've got, a, they've got a little pagoda they're under or something for their quintet. But uh, as somebody who used to be in brass quintets and quartets and duets and stuff, I, mean, I relate to this one a lot as that sort of anticipation before the real, the real show gets going. Let's switch to the, let's go to another one. Yellow leaves. A girl plays hopscotch by herself. In these two haiku, the first one is really not a very, I mean, lightning flash is a, is a bit related to Kigo in Japanese tradition. It's, it's typically a summer storm sort of thing. Um, so I guess it does have Kigo to it. It's a more intuitive perception one. Yellow leaves, on the other hand, is, is more directly. Yellow leaves, a girl plays hopscotch by herself. Looking at that one and thinking it, she's really, really playing with our emotions in this one. Yes. Really. You've got the melancholy of the, the autumn Kigo. Then you've got a girl playing hopscotch all by herself. She could have had the girl playing hopscotch, hopscotch in any season of the night, you know. But the way she's done it, to pile on that melancholy and pile it on a little yes. bit more, you know. Whereas if she'd, she'd done something in the summer, totally different emotions involved. Totally different feel. So yeah. the yellow leaves are, are not as brilliant and bright and they're a little more melancholy to them. It's the, this is a coming to the end of when you can play outside a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And a girl plays hopscotch by herself. But this, uh, I like this girl. She's got self-sufficiency too. She's, she's, she's somebody who can take care of herself and still have fun, even though the leaves are yellow and their friends are not around. So I like this this courage this girl has, even though it's a little sad too. It's a little sad, yeah. But it's interesting you say that you feel that she's got a bit she's got a bit of courage because normally a yellow is a is a color we associate with cowardice, isn't it? But in this instance, I think the yellow makes it pop, and it, as a poem, I think the color that it brings into it makes the poem pop. But yeah. also, the yellow works as giving you the notion that she's got a bit of oomph about her because if again if it had been brown leaves well it would have been totally dismal the girl would have been miserable the whole lot but the yellow just gives it a bit more joy a little more fun yeah and that's right that's right 
So again, the inner and the outer are coming together here. In this case, we're seeing the girl, her inner and outer. Mm. We're looking into her psychological state and her inner inner being. And as we see her in this world, that's changing. Here, here we've got another moving one. You hear that off the one earlier about, about the, the tree house being taken down, perhaps. Moving day. The dogwood tree in full white bloom. What I like about this one as an example and what we're talking about with the seasonal element is that the seasonal element is the last thing we get. And a lot of them, we've seen it up front becoming sort of the context setter, setting the stage. But in this one, it's the last lingering thing, in fact. Moving day, the dog, so moving day is the context actually of what we're doing and where we are. And we move all times a year in the United States, of course. But moving day, the dogwood tree in full white bloom. What I, what I like in this one, that dogwood tree in full white bloom, it's just lush with blooms. And from my take, they planted that tree, <laughs> you know, years ago, or maybe not that many years ago. And they've waited for it to be blooming out, you know, and it's like, when is that tree ever going to bloom, you know? And this is the year finally it blooms, of course, they're moving. Or you could flip it and say, you're moving in. You know, isn't that wonderful that there's this beautiful full white bloom dogwood there you get to get to now enjoy uh, from somebody else's efforts from the past. So moving day, the dogwood tree in full white bloom. Summer night, this is her title poem from her book, To Hear the Rain. Summer night, we turn out all the lights to hear the rain. And this is a more direct sort of just statement of the season, summer night. Again, it's not summer nights, it's not nights in general, it's summer night, it's this summer night. We turn out all the lights to hear the rain. And this one is about just wanting to totally be there and immerse yourself in that sound and the smells and the joy of the rain. For me, it's the joy of the rain. And, you know, diminishing your other senses, turning out all the lights to hear the rain. And we have this we, this is a, this is a I don't know if it's a family or a couple, lovers, I don't have friends. Summer night, we turn out all the lights. It's almost a game. Let's, let's just let's turn on the lights and just be here on the porch, listening to the rain coming down. So this is about embracing that outer weather and just letting it come in and become the thing we are for that moment. Gershwin's lullaby, magnolia petals, ladle, fireflies. And what a haiku full of of music and music associations, of course, and illusions, and this sort of just sort of lowliness into the into the lushness of the music itself. And magnolia petals, ladle, fireflies. The magnolia petals also have this fragrant, strong smell. And they're holding, they're holding rain if there's rain, or in this case, they're ladling, the fireflies are lifting up out of these, out of these petals. So it's a magical moment. Everything's bigger than, I mean, this is, to me, this is, this is about a sort of rich, richness of feelings. And again, for me, it's real summer, June sort of feeling of, of a pleasant, isn't it great to be alive moment. I just love this one. It's not just the idea of season. To me, it's a slightly because magnolia and my magnolia is a spring thing, mm. but Again, you spoke of the richness. It really speaks of velvet and lushness and warmth and love. And I love the sound, the musicality of it. I love the shapes of it. Uh, you, you spoke about the ladle, the, the shape of the petals in mm. magnolia. I don't have fireflies here, so I can't comment on that. But the little gnats and flies that we have in the garden at the moment, would be, I could see them being ladled within the petals. The fragment and the phrase in this just fit so perfectly together. And I read it and I think, oh, this is just such a super, super piece of work. On the one hand, I think, oh, how can I ever create something as beautiful as that? But on the other hand, then I think, okay, well, she did it. And she's probably been at this a lot longer than me. <laughs> so <laughs> there's hope for me yet. And I can aspire to write something like this, but it's, it's just beautiful. <laughs> and this is a really interesting haiku in terms of, in, in some Japanese perspectives on this one, it's probably got two kigos, which they would consider a nuno. 
And yet it comes together with a rich luxuriousness mm. that for me works beautifully. You know, but the magnolia petals and the fireflies are two pretty strong kegos. Yeah. So several Japanese editors have hammered me at times for it. <laughs> so I'm, I guess I've got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about that one. It's not about a rule. It's about how this haiku and the moments coming together so beautifully. It's a wonderful haiku. I love it. I think you know? what I'm learning is that, okay, there are rules. What do, actually, what is it Jane Reichel says about rules? Learn them and then learn how to break them. And the more yeah. confident you get, the more yeah. com confident you get about knowing when it's acceptable to break the rules. This is one that just doesn't, you can't pull it out in the, you can't analyze, oh, here's the rule, here's not. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. One last one from Peggy here. Okay. Mother, daughter, small talk, snap beans. And again, with this one, um, it's, the snap beans puts us in the gardening, the garden season. The, you've got the big harvest going on. This is like sitting in the kitchen with with uh, with two or three people, in this case, mother, daughter. And they've got hours of beans to, to snap and break and get ready to can. And so the snap beans is, for me, a real strong seasonal thing. It's got dirt smell to it. And so mother, daughter, small talk. And then the whole lineup of her haiku in this one, the pop, 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 the pairing up mother, daughter, small talk, snap beans. It's all about that repetitive motion mm. and sound, in fact. And so the snap beans are the, the, the whole context and the season coming in, the gardens, garden harvest season. Let's go to, to Wally Swist, his approach to some of the seasonal element in haiku. And this is from The Silence Between Us and from his introduction called The Poetics of Walking. And uh, he writes about the importance of relinquishing ego in order to see and discover the epiphany of the commonplace. Here's a quick excerpt. Since nature, and often human nature, is found outside the walls of our homes and in the outer world, the poetics of haiku, for me, has always meant walking out into nature and having the natural world move through me. Walking facilitates a kind of psychic feng shui, either strolling into a sunlit meadow or hiking a trail up a mountain in the rain. In this activity of non-action, there is a relinquishing of ego. One's will dissolves into divine will. There is not just the sense, but the experience of all is one. And so in terms of seasonal element, what I'd emphasize here is that he literally does these walks and, and that's where he sort of lets haiku come to him and discovers his haiku. And he's not out there trying to shape things into haiku. Where he's not looking for something he can make turn into a haiku. He's the, wanting the haiku to sort of come to him and, and move through him and capture that as it, as it comes. So it's sort of a discovery, a sort of, of being in this world that's, that's talking to him almost. So it's not something he adds to his haiku as much as he's in the natural world. And it's a sense of discovery that there's always seasonal element in everything he discovers when he's out there in these poetics of walking. So I start with one that's actually indoors <laughs> from Wally Swiss. Christmas Day at Peace Peeling Potatoes. So again, the, the seasonal setting and context, of course, is this Christmas, but this is early in the day. This is before everybody has gotten up and about and is, is busy. And at Peace Peeling Potatoes, sitting there just peeling, the, getting ready and preparing for the, the big meal early on there's this other activity going on but there's this piece of, of doing that and smelling the potato and the peels and the dirt again and, and the christmas day there's all those things to anticipate and the excitement of social time and all that coming and yet for him this is the, where there's a certain kind of piece that is part of christmas here for him on this one um, so i started with one was indoor deliberately because i want to make it clear he finds these things at home as well, it's outdoors. Field of frost, the open milkweed pod. It's got some reach and some stretch. We've got some distance we're seeing. Field of frost goes out there. The open milkweed pod is closer. We noticed right here. And of course, there's a nice mixing of what the pod is doing and why it's open. And this field of frost is it's right, it's the winter coming on. This is the post-harvest 
the milkweed's already shed its seed. Everything is, is both in that transition of that. I think it's classic, the field of frost, the open milkweed pod. It's a Perfect. classic haiku. And it's just so well crafted. I, yeah. I really, really admire. Well, I, as you know, I really admire his work anyway, but that is one that really, really I can appreciate. So he's very good at it. Letting nature be nature, yeah. And trying to tend, help us to look and notice again what the what nature of nature. So it's it's very nice. Yeah, he's very good at this. I've got a couple other examples that sort of show how he he does also have the human element within things. He he rarely very rarely puts himself in the center of his haiku. It's always he's always on the just a little bit that of scans a little distant to it. And, and lets them lets them have the reality. New buds, the Ferris wheel takes another turn. This one's a playful one. It's got an interesting language stuff going on. New buds is, of course, both the new buds on the trees, the trees budding out, you know, the spring of a new relationship. But new buds also is, of course, a phrase that could be new buddies, new friends, um, that sort of sense too. The Ferris wheel takes another turn. To me, it speaks also new buds, almost like I'm at a stage in my life where the kids have gone, the kids have flown, and your relationship takes on a new new yes. meaning, a whole new life, doesn't it? So new buds, the Ferris wheel can, takes another turn. It speaks to me of that sort of relationship as well. So it's about cycles, about both yeah. going around and coming back around. This one, this one has, if you want to go literal, you got a visual of, rising up out of these budding trees and going back down into them. Yes. Uh, there's, there's some fragrance here too, as, as well. So this is a beautiful spring spring haiku. What I like about this one, again, in terms of if you're looking at it as Kigo, New Buds is a interesting Kigo because it's about starts of friendships and starts of new growth in, in the thing, the trees. So again, it has a nice sort of mixing of the human and the nature yeah. in it very well and one last one from Wally Swift because uh, it's very different than all the other ones we just read closed mental hospital swings creaking among windblown weeds so again we get a strong sense of abandonment and, mm. and decay and um, there's these weeds and they're windblown and it's sort of a kind of a late late autumn or early winter maybe almost feeling to this in October maybe it's a little bit students some my students always say this is kind of a spooky one Dr. Brooks seems like a lot of haunt, a lot of hauntiness closed mental hospital swings creaking among windblown weeds you know and so I love how this one the windblown weeds bring in in the creaking bring in the cold bring in the the movement of things and the uh, the things that have all got gone past their prime, yeah. you know, and they're they're all decaying a bit. And closed mental hospitals are just that's that's the old fashioned one. That's that's the that's the one where they sort of locked people up and and yeah. nobody went and saw them and they didn't get out much. And you know, and yeah, there are these swings there for families that visit, but you know, and, but it's 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 got a lot of again sad sadness in that one that somehow fits the windblown weeds. And if, if we go back to what we just, we discussed sort of near the beginning, we talked about people using their imagination to develop the, the seasonal connection. To me, and maybe I'm, I'm not reading it right, but there's no traditional Kigo in that There's one. not. Almost um, none of these, except no, for the, the one. True. Yeah. And yet, to me again, the, the fact that the weeds are windblown we're talking we're moving towards the end of summer into autumn again yeah. maybe well into autumn because the winds are getting up the weeds are you know are losing their power the greenness is going and so the roots are less developed or decaying yeah. as you said there's a lot of decay in there so it's a very it's a very autumnal for me again um, and with and the windblown weeds i think tumbleweed yeah i'm kansas <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can see that <laughs> and, and so for me this is also a ghost town almost yeah you know, it's really is a, a sort of a, a so you, something you might see in a ghost town and stuff. But the, the swings bring in this sort of lost childhood thing to oh, me too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, or a lost sense of fun. 
I'll just do a couple by George Sweet and then we'll go okay. to some Japanese haiku. Warm spring breeze, the old hound runs in his sleep. Warm spring breeze looks like a just traditional higo almost, doesn't it? Warm mm -hmm. spring breeze, just a yeah. quick naming of something very common. And yet the old hound runs in his sleep, makes that warm spring breeze come back alive for us. Yeah. This is one that I would say that as a reader, I might sort of almost not give the first line too much credit Yeah, the first time through. You know, warm spring breeze. Oh, I've seen that lots of haiku. And, you know, okay, warm spring breeze, sure. You know, it's kind of hot out. And yeah, I can, you know, the old hound runs in his sleep. Now I'm starting going, what's that, what's that warm spring breeze do from a dog's perspective? How, how does a dog take a warm spring breeze in? And this is an old dog. Mm -hmm. But it is dreaming, not old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so so now the warm spring breeze is full of things that trigger this dog's memories, yeah. and and this dog's uh, sense of 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 uh, being lively still. Where now it's an old dog, part doesn't run too much. So well, I want to take one that's sort of an for example of one that may look like a fairly common kiko, it actually comes alive with the rest of the haiku in that case. It Let's does, and it, it also has the, the movement it does. because of the movement of the breeze, the movement of the hound. Let's go to the last one. Fallen okay. leaves, the hands that gather them have liver spots. What I like about George's haiku here is, again, it's, it's about the inner, inner sort of consciousness and psychological being of the person he's looking at, of course. Fallen leaves, the hands that gather them. I like that the fallen leaves aren't just there on their own. They're the thing that she's interacting with. She's, she's picking them up. She's, she's looking at them and she's admiring them. The beauty of even the aged leaves have liver spots. And she's seeing this connection between herself and the, and the leaves that she's gathering. So again, there's this coming together of, of her time and, and place and the, and the things she's doing. And then if you look at it as in the way he's crafted it as well, that middle line, the fallen mm -hmm. leaves connects with the, the hands that gather them, but it also jumps the line. It does. Um, again, the connection of things. And so again, the good use of season element or Kiko is when it doesn't seem like something just stuck in now or something that's sort of given as a stop sign. Mm -hmm. it's, it's integrated into the whole haiku. Yeah. And the, the haiku itself pulls us towards it to look at it again and has these words, talking to words sort of feel to them. Again, in or out of weather, whether it's a psychological thing, an intuitive thing, or literally a word that plays on the words mm. of each of, of them. So that's what the good use of it is. I'm going to go to a couple of Japanese haiku, and we'll, we'll close with just a couple of Japanese haiku. And so these are from Masajo Suzuki's book, Love Haiku, translated by Emiko Miyashita and Lee Gerga. Wonderful translation team, both really good haiku poets in their own right. Mm. But again, I, I, want to, I want to point out again that in, in Masajo, she's a fairly, she's really good, fairly, you know, contemporary haiku writer, but she doesn't write with a group or a sensei. She's a very independent okay. woman and writer. Your letter concealed in my kimono's breast pocket, basking in winter sun. You have the same idea again, if we go back to the, the George Swede one here. Mm -hmm. Your letter basking in the winter sun. Your letter in my yes. kimono's breast pocket. Very nice. Well, so the letter is warming and the sun is warming. Yeah. And and she's got it close to her breast. You know, your letter concealed. It's a hidden. It's just mine. It's my own. It's winter sun. It's not as vivid and bright and warm as summer sun. Mm -hmm. And yet it's warmer than not having sun. In oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's still even it's, it's not a lot, but it's enough. So that letter hidden in her breast her kimono's breast pocket is enough. It's a basking, so it's basking. Mm -hmm. Basking seems out of season, but it fits perfectly here. Oh, it does, absolutely. And I wonder, you mentioned that she's a very independent writer, writing on her own without a yes. group or, or a sensei. Do you think that gives her more room to break rules? I think that what she did with that was that she really pushed content beyond some of the usual haiku content. And yet... She wanted to follow rules and exam a guidelines such as the Kiko. Mm. So he follows the Kiko very clearly in every haiku. 
even though some of the haikus seem to be very much about her inner life. So we'll see how much we see I in here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is not relinquishing the ego at all. This is embracing the ego and yet also following the key goal. So we get, again, a Western concept, but she, she had fun with it. April Fool, I do up my hair and go nowhere. So this playful sort of self, self joke. Um, and, and just, you know, I'm just gonna dress up anyway. You know, and, and who's the April Fool? I'm the April Fool. You know, so there's just a playful joyfulness in this one. And, and again, April Fool is definitely this sort of time of year. It's a sort of time of, of joking and playing and mm. holy bastards on, on people. And she's, she's, she's very independent, but also kind of alone here. So I, I'm fooling myself, but I'm also taking care of myself. I got some self-care and self-love here. A glass of beer. I serve it to a man I will never love. So some people might not think this one has a key go. And this is what I was going to ask you. Where's the key go? Tell me. <laughs> In the, in the Japanese tradition, beer is a summer kigo. It's it oh. means it's the middle of summer. As soon as you say beer, and we we kind of we kind of I always think of beer as kind of October, <laughs> October fest, you know, or or but also summer is really good too. But <laughs> but but yeah, in the Japanese tradition, beer is beer is very highly associated with summer. Okay. A glass of beer, I serve it to a man I would never love. It's not the key focus of it though. It's, nope. it's not the it's not like we're getting into the season of beer here. So while she'll use, she'll use a Kiko pretty deliberately, it's, the, it's not like the main point, finally, of the haiku. Mm-hmm. It's there, but it's a background enhancer. Pure snow, I scoop it up with black gobs. This one, this, the snow is something that's she says it's pure, pure snow. It's it's white, it's perfect, it's beautiful. She's messing it up by even touching it. Mm. You scoop it up with black gloves. Again, there's this sort of disconnect she's got between yeah. the, between herself and the snow. She's not pure snow. Gloves are pure. They're in a way defiant, but I also want it. I want to draw that to me. I want to be close to that pure thing. I, I just wanted to point out again that while her content pushes the boundaries of haiku some in terms of it's about her independence and mm-hmm. and she's pushing some of the some of the and the whole haiku the collection of love haiku she does she does really push the challenges on the woman's role and stuff in Japan when she was mm-hmm. writing she 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 was writing in the 50s 60s 70s 80s mostly okay and so she was a bit of a of a of a liberator for uh, women haiku writers but she stuck with the Kiko tradition also very, very thoroughly. In, in some ways, just like she talked about my betrayed husband, I wash his tombstone with meticulous care. So, and I wonder, again, that's another one, where is the Kiko? But I'm guessing that washing tombstones is probably um, a season. Kind of, right. In our culture, we think of that as Memorial Day, probably, or oh, okay. or, or another time of the year when you, when you go visit the graves, you know, and, mm-hmm. and pay respects. So it's a similar sort of thing. It's it's a time you're supposed to show that you care and you yeah. taking care of that. So I wanted to give that one. Then I'm going to go to Basho for one of the last last ones here. This, these are some haiku by Matsu Basho, mm-hmm. translated by Makoto Oeda in his book, Matsu Basho. In this, I want, to, I want to just point one more thing out about, about seasonal element in Kigo. And that is like, I want to start with this early one by Basho when he was a, a teenager, in fact, or maybe barely. I think he's still a teenager. The old lady cherry is blooming, a remembrance of years ago. So it has a, it has a seasonal kigo, uh, sakura, mm-hmm. cherry tree, cherry blossoms. And yet it's written in a way that's not really about cherry blossoms. Mm-hmm. It's not really about a cherry tree. It's sort of about an old lady, but not really about an old lady. And it's not really about what she looks like now or what the cherry tree looks like now. It's about what she might've looked like if you just imagine it. Mm-hmm. This is yes. a terrible haiku, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the kigo, but it's a really bad haiku. It's nasty. Um, the old lady cherry is blooming. I remember it's of years ago. So this is a young person's snide sort of joke, actually, among the couriers. In the, and this is, a, this is sort of a court, court poet yeah. haiku when Basha was young. And uh, he's still a, a samurai uh, trying to out, outwit everybody else and show how clever and smart he is. So it's, it's, it's got a... It's got a lot of misguidedness. 
again, we can see that, yeah, there could be an old cherry tree that's blossoming and it's, it's beautiful, even though it's not as beautiful as it used to be before it had broken branches and split down the middle and from storms or whatever. It's just, it's just a hint of the beauty it used to be. Okay. Yeah. You can, you can get that from this, Yeah. you know, or you can get that it's old lady who looks, she's really dressed up. She's got her kimono on for a cherry blossom viewing and she's really got her fineness on. She's, she's looking good. Yeah, but you know, yeah, she probably looked really good in the past, you know. So it's it's just yeah. rude. All it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that takes you back. It's it's historically it's good to be reminded of where the haiku that we know today comes from. Right. And so if Basho had stayed with that, we would not know him today. That's all he knew. Oh, that's about. the truth. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here is the contrast to that. Where so in this one, he sort of just tossed in the, the fact that it's a cherry or a cherry, you know, sakura, cherry blossoms mm-hmm. is not really the point. It's really a point about being snarky. But here's one that where, where the where the kiko and the seasonal element is totally integrated in the experience. On a bare branch, a crow is perched. Autumn evening. So on this one, we just have this letting things be themselves. A bare branch is a bare branch on a bare branch. We're getting a whole strong sense of that image. There's not leaves on it. This is late autumn. A crow is perched. A crow is perched. It's just going to be there. It's not going anywhere. When you close your eyes and imagine it, you get all these silhouettes of grays and black. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of color in this one. It's it's you know it's getting late night. The this is this is the winter is coming. The crow's not going to leave. Crows stay all winter. You know, on a bare branch, a crow is perched. It's just there. This haiku was the one that Basho said after he wrote it. I want all my haiku to be as good as this one after this. Because this one, he's not turning everything into something else. He's letting it be itself. He's letting the things be. And yet we still get an emotional reaction, an emotional response of sort of this darkness, this impending winter, this aloneness. And so the seasonal element is not an add-on. It's the very thing we're feeling, that autumn evening when things are getting dark. You alluded to this earlier when you... The epiphany, yeah, the epiphany of the commonplace. The epiphany of the commonplace. That's the one. Yeah. Um, you could sum that one up with, with that. And I wonder also, just rereading it again, it, is this the one that inspired Ezra Pound? I think it was. Yeah, yeah, I think it is one that really struck Ezra Pound too, the vividness of it mm. and, and the clarity of it yeah. and how the emotion is suggested but not spoken. Yeah. So this sort of became sort of the hallmark. Can we, can we let things be real and still sort of see how they make us feel and respond, mm. you know, and care in some way? He starts writing these realism, as you're talking about, mm. realism haiku. He start, his, his content just blows up then. Basho starts looking around and saying, why have I never written about that and this and that? And all these things that I've been ignoring because I've been trying to find the the haiku that fit that kigo or out of our tradition of all these poems that have come before, you know, I'm sure I can write a good frog haiku he does later, but but, uh, a certain one. I see. (laughs) The first snow, daffodil leaves bend under the weight. So of course, the seasonal word is the first snow, the, the kiko, the daffodils are also a season. Oh, you got two in one. Um, the first snow, daffodil leaves bend under the way. We get that sense of how, but they're built for that. Mm. They, this, is not, this is not unusual for daffodils to get some snow on them. And they hold the weight. They are strong, even in their, in their resilient. And they're still going to be out there. And when the snow melts, they'll be right there in full happiness as daffodils and beauty. This one also has an interesting thing. So the Japanese, this is, this is, this makes total sense that the first snow is in this, in the Japanese new year, which is sort of late February, early March. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so the first snow of the year would be a snow in, in spring, actually. It's a, it's a spring snow. Western readers think first snow is going to be like October or, yeah. you know, or November or something, or maybe if you're in Canada, it's, a, it's in, in August or something. But, yeah. but uh, so, so we think of, we go, wait, how could you have daffodils with the first snow and stuff? This doesn't work, you know? And, and my point is that the Kigo tradition in Japanese is very Japanese and it's based on their climate, 
It's based on their culture. It's based on their historical associations with these images. And it's and some of them transfer and become universal. Some of them don't very well. Yeah. And and so so we can we can still use the same strategy of Kigo, that a seasonal element adds a enhancing context or aura or atmosphere to a haiku that's wonderful and that on some levels they will tap into human universal collective consciousness mm. but at other levels they might be very cultural yeah and move very well beyond your audience of your of your culture and stuff too so it's sort of a cautionary tale about that we still love this haiku whether we understand that the first no is in the spring really in the mm. japanese cultures phrasing or not we still love the haiku of it I would be one of the people that says the first no, what's all that about? But this weekend, my daffodils are coming up in the garden. It's going to be snowing. Yeah, the, I'm going to have the very same image in yeah. my garden. So it works for me, albeit a bit weirdly. Our associations of snow is coming at the end of harvest, at the end of autumn, and, and a first snow being sort of the start of the of the hardness of winter mm. is actually much more of an association like his, his, his crow on a bare branch. Yeah than it is the first snow in the Japanese culture. So Kigo translates sometimes and sometimes not. I will close up by mentioning this, this World Kigo Database is really an awesome project by Dr. Gabby Grieve. And um, she's, she's been trying to look at globally, can we create a sajiki? A sajiki is again, that dictionary mm. or encyclopedia of Kigo. Images and phrases that bring us associations of a seasonal element into into our lives or, or poetry and so it's a fabulous fabulous thing this world kigo database collecting words and images from around the around the world for us to think about in matsuyama they had a, a big conference in 1997 and this was the topic um, about how kigo translate or not around the world mm. and so there were people arguing we should just use key words like snow or um you know other words that become phrases that we know around the world and stuff and not so worried so much about whether they're Kigo or not. And so instead of seasonal references, key words were being proposed as a more international sort of haiku uh, sajiki that we could have that would sort of be about how we as humans have some shared universal elements and stuff that we could tap into in our haiku. Mm. So that's where that, that came from. But anyway, so seasonal element in haiku is an enriching element that lets us enter into the haiku in a broader space of context than just the thing we're focused on. I'm glad you brought up the um, World Kigo database because that was half the reason I wanted to look so often at Kigo this year. So I'm hoping that a few things will happen. That One, we will come up with and maybe contribute to this project, the World Database uh, with new ideas on, on Kigo, but also that we'll start thinking around the issue and coming up with imaginative ways of describing and connecting the season to the poem and to each other. So we, we all have that emotional sort of inner outer connection that you've spoken of. And I think the other interesting thing that you've brought up and we you highlighted, and I'd like to go back to it again in a few of your contributions today, that the Kigo doesn't have to go first line it doesn't all automatically have to be in your face in the first line, but if you give somebody a bit sort of a hint of where you are in the, in terms of time and, and yeah. connection, that that's sort of enough to me. Right. You know, I'm just one person. No, that's right. No, that's absolutely right. And, it does you know, not have to be the starting point. It, it doesn't. That I thought was really interesting. And I just say to people that the slides will be on YouTube. So if you want to go back and, and reread right. some of the slides that, you Randy have put up and some that you weren't able to get around and read please do go back and have a look at them because they're they're an interesting bunch and there was one question that I didn't quite know where to interrupt you and ask it sure. we all think of haiku as nature poems they connect to nature don't they but I'm coming round to the idea that rather than nature the seasonal element of our poem might even be that bit more important because it allows us to focus in and connect it a little bit more than just talking about a tree, a, a sparrow, whatever. We have a context to the nature. Yeah, I, I really think that uh, for me, I mean, there's, there's a lot of indoor nature and outdoor nature. Mm -hmm. 
And for me, haiku does need to invite the reader into a presence of being in the world in some way. Mm -hmm. And so whether that being is in a bedroom or on a walk or on a in a kayak, you know, um, all the places that we be as humans where we, we live are fair game in my view for a haiku. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that some, some things are a little harder to uh, evoke a sense of that atmosphere or that, again, setting and scene that a haiku needs. So every haiku, I believe, needs a scene, a setting, a sense of being in the world somewhere. Mm -hmm. So for me, the haiku that don't achieve that appear to be only in the head. Yeah. They're sort of just talking to myself in my head. And I'm talking about this as a writer as well as a reader. I'm, I'm, I'm plenty of haiku to just sort of be talking to myself. Oh yeah, haven't we all? I think. <laughs> and and uh, they don't if they don't get out of my head, then they don't become real in the world. And I don't believe readers really want just to go and get my thoughts. Mm -hmm. I think they want to go live something in the in the world through my haiku. And so that's for me the most important thing. So for me, the outdoors seasonal element is one way to bring in that sense of being in the world, but it's not the only way. I think you hit, an, hit upon something else interesting there. I don't know about you, but I'm often asked to differentiate between a micro poem and a haiku. And possibly one way of differentiating, differentiating the two is, a, is a micro poem just a, a poem, not just, but is it a poem that is in your head? Yeah. Uh, and doesn't have the inner outer connection. There's, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of coup, a lot of haiku yeah. being written that are playful language play that are that are I, I find them fun and interesting mm -hmm. I don't find some of them connecting in my heart or in my in my sort of sense of of wow that one really made me remember and feel or made me think again that something or maybe look again at something and notice something I've, I've walked by but just never noticed before yeah so it has to do a little bit with what people want from the poetry and from haiku so for some people, and I love language play. I love, I love a playful poet. I love finding new words. I love when somebody t uses a word in a way that I think, like, well, I've never seen that in that word before. So I, I love words and playfulness with words. But I guess if I feel like it's just play, when I got done, I'm like, well, that was clever. Then I haven't, I haven't gone to that place that Peggy Wiles talks about sharing but I haven't entered into a space that's I I guess for me a little bit spiritual and sacred even where we share our lives yeah and I want haiku to do that maybe too much I have to say thank you very much for this terrific workshop and as you know I was particularly pleased that you read some work from Wally because he's I'm very good. He's, he's he's excellent but before you go I just wanted to tell people one of the reasons that I asked you along today Eddie Lee, who is one of our writing community, wrote to me and said that uh, your book oh. Schools Out had had quite an influence on her writing. Okay. That sort of gave me the shove to get in touch with you again and ask you to come along today. And we've already mentioned two of your most recent books. Schools Out is one of your older books, but mm -hmm. it's still available through Amazon if anyone else wants to be inspired as, as Eddie was. And I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Patricia. No problem. Thank you, Randy, once again for today's workshop. And I really hope this won't be the last time we hear from you. Yeah, sure. It's been be glad to come back. <laughs> great because it's been a real treat having you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's the longest workshop we've done so far. And actually, there's a little bit more, which you can watch on our YouTube channel. And if you watch it on our YouTube channel, you can read the slides and the poems at your own convenience. And in the show notes, I'll put what I took away from the chat. And what I'd love for you to do is email me and tell me what you took away from the chat too. Thanks. Now, as you know, I like a project that spreads the joy of writing and reading haiku. And here's the latest project that I've heard about. 
If you know of more, please, please let me know about them, and we'll spread the word. Ted Sherman, who I know from the London Haiku Group, has been working on a haiku project with prisoners. I'll let him tell you all about it. Now, as I said earlier, I invited Ted Sherman along to talk to us today. I'm getting to know Ted through the London Haiku Group that I virtually attend. But let me tell you a little bit about him. Like myself, he grew up in London, but has spent the last 11 years living in Bristol, which is in the southwest of England, for those of you who don't know it, with his three kids. Alongside poetry, he has a lifelong passion for music and studied at the London College of Music, spending many years playing in bands. Now he's not been writing haiku for that long, but he's already had some success, having been published in Modern Haiku, Blue Outlier, Seashores, Blythe Spirit, Frog Pond, Prune Juice, Presence, and the Wales Haiku Journal. He's guested on the People's Poetry Podcast, and I'll put the, show, the link in the show notes so you can have a listen to it. And of course, he's now agreed to come along and talk to us, but not about his poetry, rather about a project he created and delivers with David Breakspear. It's called the Pen and Corrections Project, which works with serving prisoners in the UK to produce haiku. I thought you might be interested to hear more about it. Ted, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, and hello to all of your listeners. As you said, I'm, I'm here to, to not talk about my haiku, but to talk about a project which I started during lockdown, and it's called Pen and Corrections. It is a project which is supporting currently incarcerated prisoners to learn about and write their own haiku. So I'm just going to talk quickly about why the project was developed and where it came from, what we did as part of the project, and then what we learned from the project. As you said, Patricia, I am relatively new to writing haiku. I guess I started probably at the beginning of the first lockdown, so it's been about a year that um, I've been writing. I love haiku, and I wanted to share that love of haiku. I wanted to share how they make me feel. Um, they're really great for my mental health. They help me feel calm and control and, and they're really good at making me very grounded and feel present. So I wanted to share that, this kind of new love. I also recognise that they're quite an unthreatening form of poetry, quite, quite easy to step into, I guess, but intriguing uh, in their complexity. So I wanted to share this and I work as, I'm the Commissioner of Adult Drug and Alcohol Treatment Services in North Somerset. I've worked in that area for, for many years now. Um, and I had this idea of sharing or trying to get people in recovery from drug and alcohol problems to write haiku, so to share haiku with them, to teach them and try to get them to write it. So that was my initial thought was, OK, how, how do we do? How could I do this? Um, and I also had a bit of a challenge for myself. I was like, you know, I've only been writing for a year. Do I know enough? Could I impart my knowledge about haiku and 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 help people understand them and write them and would anyone be interested in in doing that so i had this idea i had i wanted to write haiku with people recovering from drug and alcohol problems and then i was listening to the people's poetry podcast which featured david breakspear who is a poet who spent many years in prison himself uh, and so i listened to him talking and it was an inspirational uh, interview and i reached out to him via Instagram uh, and said, I've got this idea to write uh, haiku with people in recovery from drug and alcohol problems, but maybe it might work with people in prisons. What do you think? Do you think, would you like to come on board with me? And he said, yes, which then made me go, okay, now what do I do? I haven't really thought about you saying yes. So we, we communicated back and forth, got it to a point where we go, okay, this is what we could do, you know, rough ideas. And then I, through my contacts at work, made contact with prisons across the southwest and just wrote to them saying would you be interested in a haiku project for your prisoners and they said yes which then meant oh god i really have to uh, do something now 
we had a group that we were now working with and we had prisoners uh, prisons involved and so that was where pen and corrections was really formed through this fortuitous just reaching out to people and saying do you think this is a good idea and informing it another kind of why developed which was i wanted to test then could haiku be delivered remotely because we were in lockdown so you know i wasn't going to get into the prisons and would this be enough to draw people in to this form of poetry a very interesting kind of question that i was asking was could poetry uh, could haiku work in a prison setting you know a setting that's typically lacking in access to nature and, and the seasons so yeah so that became a, another kind of goal uh, to answer those questions i guess my kind of approach of reaching out to people has, has served me pretty well certainly during lockdown I, you know i've reached out to jimmy who runs the people's poetry podcast and he he kind of uh, invited me on i've i reached out to you patricia and you invited me on david got on board so and i also during uh, d- during this uh, the development of the project i reached out to um the daughter of johnny borinsky so amy borinsky uh, and to, to to talk to her about using her dad's uh, haiku in in the project so uh, yeah i mean there was lots of generosity the, the fact that i got all these people involved and and have been invited on things probably says more about their generosity than my ability to negotiate these things so but i mentioned Johnny Barinsky um, and his daughter allowed me to use some of Johnny's haiku in the lessons that we that we developed for the Pen and Corrections project. And Johnny was a was a haiku poet from North America. He died uh, in 2018. He'd been writing haiku since 1975 and had published eight books during his life. Johnny served several prison sentences for non-violent protests to war and trident nuclear weapon systems and whilst in prison he wrote a lot of haiku so this was quite a quick answer to one of the kind of goals and one of the whys of the project was yes haiku can be written in prison by prisoners um, and it can be very successful so it got it kind of spurred us on really you know knowing this reading his poetry so here is one of johnny's haiku in 10 summers The convict's first visit, dragonfly. In 10 summers, the convict's first visit, dragonfly. So what did we do? Well, as I said, we had some prisons involved or showing an interest. Initially, there were nine prisons that said, yes, they'd like to take part in the project. Eventually, that whittled down and only two actually took part. And that's HMP Eastwood, which is in Gloucestershire, and HMP Ashford, which also is in randomly is in in Gloucestershire so we developed a a, a haiku pack lesson pack which was emailed to prison staff so we had a single point of contact within both the prisons that we had to go through so we emailed a lesson document out to them Um, that was then given to any prisoners that were interested in getting involved that lesson pack had space for prisoners to develop and write their own haiku once they were right written they they were scanned and sent back to us and myself and david then wrote bespoke comments and suggestions for each each of the prisoners that had written haiku and these were sent back and then we had final submissions so we eventually got a kind of final version of of each haiku sent back to us and we we then collated them so that writing phase ran from november 2020 to february 2021 before I go on and read you some of the haiku that were produced and, and tell you about the kind of end of the project, I thought it was important to just pick up on some of the things we learnt doing, whilst doing this project. So one of the things certainly I learned about the acceptable language that needed to be used when you're communicating with people in prison. So, and David was very, David Breakspear was really helpful in making sure the way I communicated was easy to understand, making sure yeah, the terminology was was clear. Prison governance was something that I had to get my head around. How do we communicate people into and out of the prison? Uh, what can be said, what can't be said? And in developing the um, lesson pack, I had a conversation with the haiku poet, Paul Chambers, and he put me on to Jack Kerouac's haiku. And they they were very useful in, in kind of um, showing a a haiku you know haiku that might be 
more accepted by by the audience that we, that we were targeting i quickly learned the amount of time it takes to gather stuff from prisoners and prisons it's a slow old process sending stuff off waiting sometimes weeks for any sort of response so it isn't you know isn't a, a an audience and a, a setting that is quick it takes a long time to write responses to people's creative writing you get stuff back and you've got to write a, a sensitive useful constructive response for for them and it takes some time so we had 13 prisoners who got involved in the project at first nine eventually uh, submitted final haiku it was interesting that initially the the virtual the remote access to prisoners seemed a bit of a barrier and and i think maybe in some ways it was but it certainly got us around any issues of geography you know that the project could be delivered to anywhere in the country because it's done remotely uh, and possibly it's less daunting you know you can uh, send th- you're not face to face with people uh, and maybe that's maybe that's some good for some uh, individuals as i said we started with 13 prisoners some of them dropped out that was something that we had to uh, learn about and deal with that people didn't stick the, the the program out not everyone did most of them did but but not all of them and some of them were released during the project so uh, it was hard to follow up with them but I guess importantly what we did learn was that it works people are generous prison officers were generous the prisoners prisoners themselves were generous in in their time and their effort and the prisoners are brave you know they communicated and shared their poetry their creative writing with people that they've never met. I was honoured that people would do that. So here are some of the haiku. So we ended up with 15 haiku. I'm going to read you three of them. For prison governance reasons, we can only use people's first names so that there is confidentiality. So I, I will read you these. Saying your name at first light, birds are calling. Saying your name at first light, Birds are calling. That's by Clive. Early Sunday morning, from my cell I watch mother birds gathering food. Early Sunday morning, from my cell I watch mother birds gathering food. Rachel. Dark winter sky, my whistles blown across the cathedral grounds. Dark winter sky, my whistles blown across the cathedral grounds. Elaine. To conclude, just some thoughts of myself and David and Ollie Francis, who has come on board with the project to help us pull the final bit together. We've collated all of the 15 haiku and Ollie has done a wonderful, amazing job of turning them into a, a really gorgeous looking book. And in reading the poems, when I sent them to Ollie, um, he came back with some thoughts which I I wanted to use here in conclusion. Ollie said that the poems really showed to him that the little things for this poets matter. He talked about how us in the outside world, so not, not in prison, don't often stop to focus on the things around us, on the little things. But here we have an audience that have been taken out of the big wide world, taken out of normal life, he got this real sense that real little things really mattered and and maybe lockdown has kind of highlighted that for us that there are the little things in life really do matter for me i think the project has has really been about generosity it's you know reaching out to each other sharing giving up their time giving you know being brave and 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 confident and stepping out of their comfort zone you know has really created a kind of bond between prison and people you know us on the outside world for david he talked about collaboration he and he and i collaborated over this project we've never met in person prisons and us collaborated and the prisoners uh, and us have collaborated so now we're at a stage that we kind of want one last collaboration and generosity and we're going to launch a kickstarter campaign which if you go to our new website which is penandcorrections.com you can register your interest in the Kickstarter campaign for the book. So we are looking to raise some funds to get the book produced, printed, 
and then sent out to anyone that, that supports it. Any profits that come from that are going back into two charities that support the children or with parents in prison. So that's Children Heard and Seen and Storybook Dads. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that. It was really, really fascinating. And what I liked about it is it it's really something I believe in, the, sh- the sharing of, of haiku. There's a certain joy in seeing something, in collaborating with other people and seeing it grow, especially mm. when it's doing some good. From what you said, it didn't just do the prisoners uh, some good. You got a lot of joy out of doing it as well. How did you keep yourself motivated when you were getting dropouts and you were getting a a slow response time? I think um, because I've been working throughout lockdown and I've got three kids, I think actually the number that we had was a manageable number. You know, I think if, if the project had kind of taken on been any bigger it would have been very difficult to manage alongside work I was also intrigued you said you were a little bit worried when you set out that you didn't know enough yeah did did you or were you okay (laughs) did I know enough I think so I think so and I had I had the generosity of of lots of people to look over what I was planning what I was saying in in the lesson pack so yeah I I think I did know enough certainly enough that the the end results from my perspective were very impressive you know for people who none of them had written haiku before they were getting lesson they were getting the lesson and then feedback only in writing so it wasn't so there was no face-to-face or even verbal contact you know I was very impressed with what they produced in the end so um so I must have done something right I guess I guess one thing I didn't uh, mention was we ran a competition as well so all 15 haiku went into a competition and Ian Storr of Presence Journal selected his favorite which is going to be published in uh, one of the upcoming journals and and he was very complimentary about the um the final haiku so so yeah i guess i did something right the end product is going to become a book mm-hmm. you've got the kickstarter um, well you've got the idea of the kickstarter any idea when you you'll probably get it going we're hoping for right at the beginning of april we've just got to do a bit more planning as i say if you go to www.penandcorrections.com there is a a place for you to drop your email in and then you'll be kept updated about when the kickstarter goes live okay and i'll put that link on the show notes so people can, can click on there as well ted thank you very much for coming along and telling us about your your really worthy haiku project and as i said before i'll put the contact details on the show notes so if people want to register some interest with you they can Mm -hmm. Um, and there may be some people who are listening today who would like to run a project similar to yours in their own territories is it okay if they contact you also yeah absolutely yeah yeah absolutely definitely thank you once again for coming along and talking to us i look forward to telling people that the kickstarter's up and running and the the book is out and we'll keep everyone posted through the the podcast thanks so much Ted. Thank thank you Well now, my thanks to Randy and Ted for talking to us today. I learned so much and enjoyed listening to all the different haiku we've heard. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast. Do let me know. And don't forget, there's lots of info in the show notes and both of these chats will be uncut and on our YouTube channel. And I'd dearly love it if you could support our writing project on YouTube. Watch the video and write your haiku in the comments. And of course, do watch our PTV haiku moments. And let the poets know that you appreciate them. It's always a little boost, isn't it, when somebody tells you how much they've enjoyed your work. And most important, send me your haiku and senryu for our euphony topic. The deadline is the 20th of April. Your editors are waiting with bated breath to read them. 
And that's all I have for you today. I'll see you in a couple of weeks with our No Ego podcast. Till then, keep writing. If there's something missing from the podcast, or I've messed something up, just email me and I'll put it right. Ciao.